Take my hand and hold it tight. Hello, welcome to the labs. I've been XRFing standards, so standard reference materials, all morning. It's now after lunch, I've just come back off my lunch break. I couldn't actually talk to the camera this morning because there was a student having uh, supervision behind me on the SEM. So I just got on with my work very quietly and time lapsed for you. Now this afternoon I basically got to do the exact same thing again on the other instrument. We have two identical instruments. Then I need to back up all of our old data and swap some memory cards over. So it's a full day of lab upkeep which is about 30% of my job here. And one of my main responsibilities is to look after the standard reference material collection. Here in the Cambridge Archaeological Science Laboratories, I have a set four standards, one iron, one copper, one copper alloy with gold, and one more pure gold that I run, as well as three ceramic standards. And those I run every other month or so, and we basically check how the instruments are doing over time. The theory is that we plot the results and then over time, if there's a shift in one direction in terms of um, one direction, far too easily distracted, in terms of <laughs> if the results are as we expect them to be, because these are standard reference materials, they have, let me show you, they have certificates with them. We know exactly what is in them, what they're meant to contain chemically. And in theory, that is what our instrument should tell us is in them. <laughs> anyway, I am setting up our second XRF. It's a handheld XRF, portable XRF, PXRF. Spit it out, Rosie. It is a Vanta M series. And the X-rays come out of here. There's no battery in it at the moment, just so you're aware. This is the trigger if we're doing handheld, but I put it in this barbecue type contraption here which is basically a lead cabinet which means we can lock it into the p p position it's the lead we can lock it into position and put the object or standard on top the x-rays go up and we have the cage there to stop them escaping into the wide world i'm gonna get on with it so here we have the battery this matches up with the little arrows goes in there and then this matches up inside. Now the battery's in there, we will just leave it on the side for now because I'm going to set up my laptop, set up software and then I will run a cow check basically to see how the instrument's feeling today before we actually do any analysis. So I'm running the cow check now and as you can see I've got it connected to my laptop so this is roughly two meters distance which is what we should have to stay far enough away from the x-ray danger zone and it passed so now we can get straight back on with analysis now I'm gonna go and grab some gloves because these are still a bit powdery on the outside and also I don't want to be touching the metal standards with my just bare fingers in case it starts to affect the surface of the metal Okay, so I'm going to start with our ceramic standards. These are just ready-made in their little containers for XRF analysis. As you can see, the standard covers the entire bottom of those little pots. And these standards are ones which we'd use for bricks, CBMs, right building materials, and ceramics pots. I'm going to start with NIST 679. I'll start with that. Oh, no, one. I'm getting ahead of myself. What I need to do is <laughs> put this in here. So this clips in here. This clips in here. Now that's in. What I do is I take the standard and I pop it on top of here. And I'll show you what the software looks like. So you can see it here in the window that this is actually our standard over the x-ray window. And I need to make sure that I have the XRF on the right setting so that it's looking for the right elements. So to do this, I select our geochem method and then a user factor, which my colleague made. And this user factor needs a collimated beam, which basically means that instead of being spread out, it's concentrated into one small space so it looks like this on the camera here and if i change it to uncollimated 
like this. And this is important because we use collimated versus uncollimated depending on the object that we're analysing. So if we're analysing metal and we can only clean a very small space of the surface, we're going to need the collimator. And for metal it's not such an issue because metal is generally fairly homogeneous, whereas ceramic is often not homogeneous at all. You've got lots of inclusions and it's better to use, where possible, non-collimated because then this makes a bigger average of the area instead of just analysing one inclusion which may not be necessarily representative of the entire object. So for this user factor, this setting, the total runtime is 90 seconds, it runs for 30 seconds, then to 60 seconds, so it has beam 1, then beam 2, and each beam has different elements enabled that it's going to measure. And this is because they are different voltages. Then, here you go. For this method, we have beam 1 and beam 2. So beam 1 is 40 kilovolts, and it has all of these elements. Beam 2 is 10 kilovolts, and we have magnesium, aluminium, silicon, sulfur, etc. So these are all our slightly lighter elements. Now, this process is a whole lot of waiting <laughs> between analysis. This is 90 seconds, the metals is only 60 seconds. So it's a lot of waiting, but there's not enough time really to be getting on with a big other task. Finally finished standards. It's like quarter past four now. And what I need to do next is back up the XRFs. And we're changing the SD cards that are in them to slightly bigger ones. So I need to move everything off those onto the backup and then put the new ones in. Hello, it's now half five in the office and I'm just processing the standards and I'm using a, spread a spreadsheet. I'm putting my spreadsheets that I've made into the R script that my colleague Kate made and it's, it's I mean, it's working now. <laughs> R is not intuitive for me at all, so it was not working at first, but that was entirely my fault. I kept putting the wrong things in and not reading her instructions. She's made very, very thorough instructions and I just can't follow them apparently. But now it's working, I'll show you. So I've made this graph, which shows the percentage error and the percentage error is basically the difference between the expected value and what we actually got. And I've just done this one. So again, percent error. And you can see we have most error in cadmium, cobalt, and chromium. This is all of the ceramic standards. Oh. Good morning! I am at Sutton Hoo, we're on a work day out. It's so bright, I can't see anything. So everybody's here. There's the boat. We're going to the house first, and then we're going to do the mounds. And then this afternoon, I'm meeting Giselle Karali, who is excavating with Time Team at the moment. And she basically arranged this visit to come and see what they're up to. And I'm so excited. Hi, I'm Ella, and I study uh, at I'm inside the house. What are you up to? Are you oh my god. What's in your excavation? Mm. Mm. See, you see the, the curvature here? Yep. It's a bowl. I'm obsessed with this hat. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Have you done it? I, I found a time team jacket. <laughs> so, what's in the drawer? It's all different kinds of pottery. So, we have stuff from the 15th century, from the 13th, from the 14th. Um, this one's cool. This is 5th to 8th century Anglo Saxon. Shell tapered wear. So I'm not, this must be like the top of something. I'm not sure actually. That's really cool. Have you spotted anything interesting? A few mounts. A few mounts. Yeah. Whoa. Um, a bench. A bench. So, little thing in there. 
And successfully, Rob. Yeah. It's in 1991. You like when they miss. <laughs> Ooh, and 19 is, number 19 is ex execution grade. Okay. Interesting. 39 victims of execution were buried in two groups between the 8th and 12th centuries. So later period. One around round 5 and the other beside the ancient trackway at the edge of the mountain. Oh yeah, okay, so there's one. Oh, well, maybe those gravel. Do you see where they're Yeah, they're actually yeah, yeah, yeah. grave shaped. <laughs> yeah. So here we are. There are. A bird has a cricket in its. Really? So there's 18 months, that's what you said, right? Yeah. 18. All different sizes and some execution burials from a few hundred years later. Yeah, the, the, the silver helmet they found in the ship. The most impressive of the burials, oh, without a chamber, is of a young man who was buried with his horse. It's a choice. Oh, oh, we're going into choice. the museum. Mm -hmm. Who's the first king of England? Go. If you were in the burial, what object would you be? At least I don't look like that. No. Original objects on loan from the trustees of the British Museum. Uh. So this is all original. <laughs> it's a perfect fit. Okay, we are at the excavation. Well, we're near the excavation, this is by the entrance hall. And I've just met with the set. Hello! Look at, look at her merch. Look at this. Oh. Is that? Amazing. Is that? There you go. Hi, yeah. Hello. Hey. 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 Looking at that. Oh. <laughs> okay, we are at the site. So exciting. I wish I was on the other side of the barrier. So. <laughs> What we've done is actually extended trench. You can kind of see the outline of where the trench was last year. Mm. Oh my gosh. How oh, fat? Maybe you yeah. should just do this part. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just a sat here volunteer. Okay. That's not all. just, Nothing. not just. You are a sat here um, volunteer. So that is last year's trench. The blue one. Going up that way. So this is the trench going that way. And this is last year's trench going up there. Down there with the digger is, I think it's backfilling. It's backfilling now, yeah. Right, I can actually say, I did actually dig in that one. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> and what did I find? One Natural small, features. One small piece of green glass, which is more yeah. like the 20th century. It's okay, it's still a bit of a So, Sutton, Sutton, who? Sutton is South Town. Mm -hmm. So, the two who's of the South Town. Um, and so, we're on one here, and this is burials over there, burials over here, there's burials all over there. So you can kind of get the, that idea and that image that there's loads of, of burial mounds. And there's like a there's like a boat on the ground too that was like Isn't it so cool? <laughs> We're now going to another part of the excavation, test pit, I believe, but I'm not really sure where. We're going down the hill anyway. <laughs> Following Giselle. It's really excited, yeah. Yeah, so basically this river is what all of the boats would have come along this and then up, they would have ended up getting it all the way up here. We don't know exactly how the landscape really looked down here because we don't know how the river would have moved differently. But the fact we've still got this view 
and you can actually see it from Tanmer House. So you can see the mounds from one window, you can see this river from a different window. That's Woodbridge over there. So over there's Ooh. a long boat where some where Martin Carver's actually recreating a massive boat. Which That's is very awesome. Cool. Um, <laughs> so we're here by the river looking at the test pits. And there's just lots of volunteers doing various test pits around the field. <laughs> got a digger. In Germany we had to do this with buckets for an hour and a half every morning. The same on the, the one time I dug in the bog in Ireland. Excited. <laughs> no, this is actually good. That's a real piece. 